Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN, of whom more in a bit. In the year 1907, in the offices of the White Star Line, the decision was made to construct a magnificent new class of ship, the Olympic class. These ocean liners would set new standards for the transatlantic crossing. The first, RMS Olympic, would wow the world with its size and standards of luxury. She would soon be overshadowed, for all the worst reasons, by the second member of the class, the RMS Titanic. Yet while these two behemoths were under construction, another, smaller vessel was being built nearby. Although she's a bit of a footnote in the Titanic story today, she would go on to be the last surviving ship of the White Star Line. This is the story of the SS Nomadic. The Nomadic owes her existence to a peculiar set of circumstances. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was something of a race to build the biggest, fastest and fanciest liners to undertake the Atlantic crossing. This was long before the advent of widespread commercial air travel, so the only way between Europe and America was by ship. The two biggest players were the Cunard and White Star lines. Money was no object. In fact, it seemed like nothing was any object. The Olympic class were the latest broadside in the battle for the Atlantic trade, and they were truly enormous. 882 feet long, 175 feet tall, over 52,000 tons in weight, three engines producing up to 59,000 horsepower. You get the idea. These were big ships, bigger than anything that had gone before. But that, in turn, caused logistical issues. Like, where do you put a ship that big? In Southampton, they built the new White Star dock to accommodate them. At Cherbourg, the first port of call on the way to New York, a new solution was called for. Cherbourg had only got into the transatlantic liner game in 1900, and ships had expanded faster than the port could. It quickly became too shallow for the new sea monsters plying between the continents. The solution was to try a little tender fleet. A tender, in shipping terms, is a small vessel that acts as a ferry between larger vessels and the shore. Some double up as tugboats, although that's not the case with the Nomadic. The Olympic class would have two tenders, the Traffic and the Nomadic. Incidentally, if you've noticed a pattern in the naming of these vessels, you'd be right. The names of white starships always ended in IC. Of the two tenders, Nomadic was to be the more glamorous. She would carry first and second class passengers. Traffic was for third class passengers, luggage and mail. That being said, if demand was not high, Nomadic could also take those duties on. In fact, she was almost a liner in miniature, being fitted out with luxurious saloons and even a cocktail bar. Not bad for a ship only intended to sail 30 minutes at a time. She and Traffic were designed by Thomas Andrews, the man in charge of designing the Olympic class. Also like the Olympic class, the tenders were built by Harland and Wolfe in Belfast, long-time collaborators with White Star. Nomadic was tiny compared to the ships she would serve. 232 feet long and 1,260 tons. She was powered by two compound engines fed by two Scotch boilers. The philosophy of the White Star Line was luxury over speed, and that went for the tenders as well as the big liners. Nomadic had an average speed of between 10 and 12 knots. The keel was laid down on the 22nd of December 1910, exactly 113 years before this video went out. Five months later, she was moved to dry dock to be fitted out. On the 16th of May 1911, she completed her sea trials. On the 23rd, Captain Boutard and his crew arrived to get the hang of the new ship, and on the 27th, she was officially handed over to the White Star Line. Good evening, Sir Cloudersley Witherwold here. You may remember me from my recent attempt to get around the world in 80 seconds, and I'm here to tell you that you're out of date with your old-fashioned ocean liners. Why, when it comes to globe-trotting, even the fastest turbine steamer carving the waves today is no match for this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. 
With its servers in over a hundred countries, you can virtually send your device around the world in mere seconds. That means that you can access streaming services from other countries, navigate your way around dastardly region locks, or get discounts on online shopping thanks to region-specific pricing. If you should wish to travel incognito, Surfshark's advanced encryption can keep you safe while browsing online, protecting you from scoundrelly wagabones who might be trying to snoop upon you. And it can be used on unlimited devices, so you can protect yourself, your family, and even your servants. But what's that, you say? You've fallen on hard times thanks to a weakness for a game of Chemin de Fer? Well, until the end of December, Surfshark has a special holiday deal on. You see, what you do is, you follow the link in the description below, and you enter the code JAGO to get up to six months extra free. I know high-class folks such as ourselves don't like to talk about the old financial matters, but that really is excellent value for money. But if you insist on doing things the old-fashioned way, well, I'll write to you from New York. Not that I'll actually be there, of course. On the 31st of May 1911, in Belfast, Nomadic received her first assignment. It was a big day. The RMS Olympic was to be transferred from Harland and Wolf to the White Star Line. That same day, her sister ship, the Titanic, was launched. Nomadic's job was to ferry the assorted dignitaries over to the Olympic. Among them were multi-millionaire financier J.P. Morgan and White Star Managing Director J. Bruce Ismay who would later become a notorious figure in the Titanic disaster. The passengers safely aboard, the Olympic departed to Liverpool to be readied for her first voyage. Nomadic and Traffic had their own preparations. They were steamed to their new home port of Cherbourg. Olympic was to call in on the 14th of June and the tenders would be ready. Nomadic's second meeting with Olympic went without a hitch. All 450 of her passengers embarked safely and comfortably. The great ship departed, and the little ship went back to work. She served not only the Olympic, but other White Star vessels that called in. In April 1912, a brand new liner was due to call in, one that Nomadic had encountered before, the Titanic. She sailed in on the 10th. By this time, the crews had the procedure down pat. First, the traffic would rendezvous with the liner, delivering 102 steerage passengers, the mail, the luggage, and a truly remarkable quantity of wine and cheese, as well as other provisions. As the stewards unloaded and ensured the first-class passengers' luggage was ready in their cabins, Nomadic prepared to come alongside. 142 first-class passengers transferred over, along with 30 second. At 8pm the Titanic departed. No one could have suspected that of those 274 passengers who the tenders ferried over, only 159 would see the far shore of New York. That period of about three hours from the first passengers boarding the tenders to the Titanic setting sail would give the Nomadic a place in the history books, a supporting role in one of the greatest maritime disasters of all time. The sinking of the Titanic would change history, but for the Nomadic, business went on very much as usual. The White Star Line had suffered a major blow from the sinking, but their liners still called at Cherbourg, and the little tenders still tended them. It was the First World War that would interrupt their routine. Naturally, liner traffic went into decline as the transatlantic crossing became more and more perilous. Indeed, the 1915 sinking of the RMS Lusitania by a U-boat would underline the dangers. In 1917, the tenders would be requisitioned by the French Navy. The harbours of France were an essential link in the supply line to the Western Front, and it was critical that they remained free of obstacles. To this end, despite the misgivings in the naval report about the vessel's speed and stability, they were converted into ersatz minesweepers. Nomadic managed to destroy nine German mines, having a close call when one of them detonated close enough to damage a number of the crew's personal effects, which must have been quite annoying for them. She stayed in this role until May 1919. After a brief period transporting American troops back from France, she was returned to the White Star Line in October that year. Following repairs, she went back into service, doing much as she had done before the war. Liner traffic continued to increase and Nomadic was kept very busy. 
But the White Star Line had not had a good war. Several ships had been lost in war service, and the line had scrambled to replace them with second-hand vessels and ships acquired as reparations from Germany. In 1924, the Immigration Act limited the number of people who could come to live in the USA, which in turn impacted the transatlantic shipping trade. An enormous number of people used the liners to start new lives in America, and so immigrants were a staple of the industry. White Star was sold in 1926 to Lord Kilsant, a shipping magnate who also owned Harland and Wolf. It may well have been the line's precarious position that prompted them to sell Traffic and Nomadic. Their new owners were the Compagnie Cherbourgeoise de Transbordement. I'd be amazed if I pronounced a single one of those words correctly. And their duties would expand to include any liner that required their services. On the 2nd of February 1932, the Nomadic suffered a serious collision with the liner Orinoco during a particularly busy period at the port. However, I doubt this was anything like as embarrassing as the incident on the 29th of November 1931, when she collided with traffic. In March 1934, the tenders were sold again, this time to the Compagnie Cherbourgeoise de Remorquage et de Sauvetage. Sorry again for the pronunciation. Nomadic would be renamed to Ingenieur Minard and Traffic to Ingenieur Rebel. That same year, Cherbourg would gain a new deep water harbour which enabled liners to dock in the port proper and drastically reduced the need for tenders. During the Second World War, the Nomad, sorry, the Ingenieur Minard, was used in 1940 to evacuate British troops from Cherbourg. The former traffic became, ironically, a mine layer. Number X-23. Cherbourg surrendered to the Germans on the 18th of June. X-23 was scuttled by the French Navy to prevent her falling into enemy hands. Unfortunately, fall into enemy hands she did. She was raised by the German Navy and turned into a coastal patrol ship. In 1941, she was torpedoed by the British and sunk again. And this time there would be no resurrection. Her remains were scrapped. But what about the Minard? Well, therein lies a tale. During the evacuation of Cherbourg, Chief Engineer Marie decided that he wasn't going to let the enemy get their hands on the tender. So he took command and, with a skeleton crew of French sailors, took the Minard to Southampton. There she was requisitioned by the Royal Navy and used as an accommodation ship for the rest of the war. In July 1945, she was returned to her previous owners in Cherbourg, undergoing significant repairs. But the future was not so bright. The war had brought advances in aviation, and those advances found their way to civilian life with the arrival of peacetime. In the 50s, liners would have to compete with air travel. Not so glamorous, but far faster than an ocean crossing. As jet planes increased in size, they could challenge the ocean lines for cost as well as speed. The Ingenieur Minard and her fellow tenders were hardly ever used, only coming out on the rare occasions when a liner couldn't get into port. In 1968, the last liners called at Cherbourg. Minard was sold for scrap. Fortunately, fate stepped in. Businessman Roland Spinnerwin bought the ship with the intention of turning her into a floating restaurant. And in April 1969, she was towed to Conflans in the suburbs of Paris. But she did not escape her fate unscathed. Anything that couldn't fit under the bridges on the Seine was removed, including her mast, davits, funnel and wheelhouse. The engines and boilers were stripped out. And then, nothing, for over four years. It seemed that Monsieur Spinawin hadn't thought things through. While he hesitated, the ship was looted several times. At last, he sold her to the Vincent brothers. In 1974, they took her up the Seine to her new mooring. Despite having her superstructure cut down, she still had to be partially filled with water to lower her enough to fit. Over the next three years, she was rebuilt and once again took the name Nomadic. She was barely recognisable as the ship she had once been, and she became a floating restaurant, as previously intended. In 1997, interest in the Titanic increased more than ever before following the release of James Cameron's film of the same name. Nomadic has a brief cameo in the film, albeit represented by a miniature. 
Still, this was enough for the owners to name the restaurant Le Transbordeur du Titanic, which is technically true, although the name represents three hours out of a career of 86 years. An 86-year-old ship was not an easy thing to take care of, even one as heavily modified and stripped down as the Nomadic. It seemed like red tape in the late 1990s would do to Nomadic what the German Navy had failed to do in two world wars. The problem was that any ship moored on the Seine became subject to strict regulations. They had to be examined in dry dock on an annual basis. But the nearest dry dock was outside Paris, and the rebuild of the ship had made her once again too tall to fit under the bridges. Her owners couldn't afford it, and mounting business difficulties culminated in the restaurant losing its operating licence in 1999. Despite the Ministry of Culture putting Nomadic on the Heritage Register in 2003, no one seemed interested in taking the ship on. And so she deteriorated. The fear was that she might sink, becoming an obstruction on the busy river. The Port of Paris announced that the ship was to be done away with, by whatever means necessary. It seemed like the end for the last ship of the White Star Line, the largest intact artefact of the Titanic story, a veteran of two world wars, a proud vessel that had carried passengers such as Benjamin Guggenheim, J.J. Astor, Douglas Fairbanks, Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor, J.P. Morgan, Salvador Dali, Orson Welles and Rita Hayworth. Her fate now was the Breaker's Yard, and few who had seen her at her moorings in Paris would have given it a second thought. But then something rather marvellous happened. In Belfast, maritime enthusiasts got wind of the nomadic's fate and began a vigorous campaign of fundraising. On examination, it seemed that the nomadic was in surprisingly good shape. Unfortunately, despite the hard work of campaigners, the funds couldn't be raised to buy her at auction in November 2005. Two months later, another attempt was made to sell her. And this time, the Northern Irish Department for Social Development stepped in, topping the funds up and ensuring that the nomadic could return to her birthplace. She was towed back to Belfast and berthed in the Hamilton Dry Dock, the same dock where she had been fitted out. There she was cosmetically restored and on the 31st of May 2013, she was opened to the public as a historic attraction. And so she remains an important addition to the nearby Titanic exhibition and a memorial of the golden age of ocean liner travel. And all thanks to a three-hour job in 1912. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If so, please do give this video a like and subscribe for more if you have a mind to. My main sources for this video were a visit to the ship itself, which I would highly recommend, and the book SS Nomadic, Titanic's Little Sister by Philippe Delonoy, who was also one of the campaigners behind the ship's rescue. It's a book that has far more information than I was able to fit in this video, so do check it out if you want to know more. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your support. You are the tender to my liner. I would also like to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Click on the link in the description below to take advantage of their generous offer. And I will see you all again very soon. Cheerio.